welcome back. Today's video, we're going to talk about fertilizing. <laughs> uh, I know it sounds intimidating. All those letters and NPK, magnesium, boron, calcium, silicone. Where, where are we going with this? Half teaspoons and tablespoons and I don't know. But we're going to make it simple. Um, this video is going to be a little lengthy because I do want to explain to you um, at least what the MPK stands for because that comes on all orchids fertilizer but then we're just gonna you know run through what we're giving our orchid and why and maybe you can come come up with your own solutions and provide some feedback let us know let us know but again this will be a uh, pretty lengthy video so stay tuned now why do orchids or plants need fertilizer to be fertile. We want the blooms. We want a strong plant. <laughs> we want them to get these nutrients that are available so that we can enjoy the longevity of the plant. So that the plant can, and the plant can enjoy us. <laughs> we want to give it these nutrients, right? Now, on most fertilizers, you're going to see NPK. What What's going on here? NPK. I, I'm not sure why some of the letters match and some of the letters don't. I didn't come up with the periodic table, but here we go. So the N is the nitrogen, P is the phosphorus, and the K is the potassium. Yes, K is potassium. I didn't look up why. It, let's just go into it. So generally speaking, nitrogen is going to help the leaves grow with your foliage. Phosphorus going to give you those good blooms. Potassium is sort of the mechanical man, making sure that all these things are working properly. Here, there, clink, clink, here we go. Um, now, most fertilizers will contain these three number ranges to tell you what to do. Um, or should I say, tell you uh, what's in there, I should say, rather than tell you what to do. Um, it's just what to do, but what's in there actually is suggesting when you should give uh, the orchid what. Um, now to make it simple, you would want to balance fertilizer, something with uh, the most even amount of numbers, um, because again, you want your foliage blooms and your mechanics, your, your basic overall potassium to be very equal. You want the MPK to be equal because the orchids are gonna be happy that way. They're gonna take in everything at once. Um, now, you can switch it up once you become a bit, a bit more advanced and you learn, hey, something going on with the leaves, I need more nitrogen. Hey, want more blooms, want a higher phosphorus. Hey, this plant just seems weird, but there's roots so I can still fertilize. So let's get a higher potassium. Now, um, in general, I normally recommend just sticking with one fertilizer and not switching but as a rule of thumb during the growing season you can promote a bit of a higher nitrogen um, a fertilizer because it promotes a overall strong plant the nitrogen is going to give you strong leaves and the leaves are the plant <laughs> um, it's basically the mechanism that does the work so that the bloom can you know propagate have you know, reproduction the plant way so that they can have more plants. The P, the phosphorus, is gonna give you those stronger blooms. So hey, maybe you have some some uh, strong leaves during that growing season, switch it over to a high phosphorus, get those, those real strong blooms growing right during the growing season, during the fall time, the end of the summer. And Lastly, the potassium. I really don't see too many fertilizers with high potassium. It probably has to do with some type of chemical balance that the other two would have if this number isn't placed correctly. But again, test it out. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> um, and, you know, with fertilizers, you'll see um, a lot of argument. Um, especially when it comes to the nitrogen with urea and urea free i would recommend a urea free um fertilizer because that just means the nitrogen is more available quickly to your orchid 
the urea thing has to do with um, old school growing and you know growing with bark urea is something that eventually breaks down to make that nitrogen available to the plant but because we're in these modern times and we're doing all these crazy things lord knows what we're doing and what we're putting in the pot on top of that urea so you know you just want to buy urea free fertilizer just to be safe but if you're living on the wild side go ahead and experiment let me know experiment away and let us all know now uh, with fertilization, uh, you'll have these NPK numbers, but you'll also have micronutrients that the plant will need aside from the NPK numbers. And there are some fertilizers, fertilizers, excuse me, that contain the micronutrients. There would be like boron, silicon, and calcium, a slew of things. There are two main things <laughs> that are most important. <clears throat> and that is the calcium and the magnesium. Now these micronutrients uh, will do specific things. The calcium will provide a strong cell growth, so it'll give you the very, very thick leaves. And the magnesium makes sure that those leaves are producing chlorophyll adequately. So, you know, sometimes you'll see like these vague yellow spots that, you know, aren't moving drastically through the orchid, so you know it's not some type of infection. But you'll see these vague yellow spots sometimes in the leaves, which is called chlorosis. And that means that there's a, you know, a magnesium deficiency. The plant's not producing chlorophyll and it's not, the chlorophyll is essentially your energy. So it's not getting enough energy to survive. And it's just like, what the hell are you doing? You know? And basically we want to provide these nutrients on what is considered a steady schedule people will describe that to you as weekly weekly um me i'm i'm just not a fan of these vague terms like weekly weekly what if you get a fertilizer that says that you need to provide a scoop and the scoop is huge and you know to you weekly that might be five tablespoons five excuse spoons what's a spoon five tablespoons in the gallon. That's wild. So when you want to fertilize kind of depends on, uh, for me, the size of the pot. So you do want to fertilize on a consistent basis with your Phalaenopsis because they are, generally speaking, heavier feeders than um, the other orchids that grow, Papiopetalums, for example. However, you'll, you'll note that as a rule of thumb, orchids do take very, very, very light feeds. Um, they, it'll, it'll differ, um, even by species maybe. I don't get into too many specific species. They're a lot complicated, uh, but generally it's the, it's the pot size. So during the warmer seasons, um, that February to October, October, Valentine's to Halloween, you can actually get away with fertilizing every other watering because you're watering a lot. So the, the plant has a constant flush of uh, new nutrients in and out of the pot, in, excuse me, in and out of the pot. And, you know, vice versa in the cooler, se cooler season, excuse me, um, you want to you wanna slow that down. So sometimes you, your, your fertilizing can be um, once a week because now uh, every other watering is twice a week when you were watering about three times a week, you know? Or a common average would be a fertilizing twice a month because now you're watering once a week and to keep up with that every other watering, it'll be every other week, which is on average twice a month. It's a lot of math, but if you replay that back, it'll make sense. Basically, you want to water every, excuse me, you want to fertilize every other watering with your Phalaenopsis, but depending on how much you're watering, it's going to depend on that frequency as well. Um, as a rule of thumb, you can half the dosage of what the recommendation is on most fertilizers. Um, I've noticed that a lot of um, orchid hobbyists and growers will recommend a fourth to a half teaspoon of the fertilizer per gallon. 
and that works just well. I do use that myself. I use a fourth of a teaspoon for small pots, anything that's potted um, under a four inch, and I use a half teaspoon for anything over 4.5 and above. And I've had pretty good success um, with that, that ratio, that, that balance. And lastly, um, how you fertilize and what you use. So again, you want to do those lesser amounts. Um, start as low as you can and hover around that and maybe increase it or even decrease it depending on what you, what you see your plants doing. Um, root tip burn and leaf tip burn are great indications of over fertilizing or the plant just looking like it's gonna die. Uh, the day or two after you fertilize means that there's something going on. <laughs> um, I even have you know a couple of orchids that can take a full teaspoon per gallon during the growth season. That's how much I monitor my my orchids. I, I have some that can take an eighth teaspoon all, all year round. Um, now, the most common use of fertilizer would probably probably be the dissolvable ones, whether it's granule or liquid. Um, with regard to granules, you want to make sure it's dissolved as much as you can. Um, a couple of tricks with the granule ones, the powdery ones, is to put them in a hot liquid, um, even if it's just a little bit, and swirl it around as much as you can. The night before is perfection. I normally mix my fertilizers the night before to make sure that it is fully dissolved. And again, um, for the paths, excuse me, we're on phalaenopsis, not paphipellums. For your fowls, you can fertilize at an eighth or you know a fourth, um, even a half. Just start wherever you feel comfortable. I don't recommend a half, but there are tons of people that will. I norm normally recommend starting your fertilizer at an eighth and then moving up from there. Um, if you're seeing growth at an eighth, I would provide, so I found measuring is a little weird. So I normally provide a double dosage of the eighth before I give them an actual fourth. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but two scoops of an eighth is like a little less than the actual scoop of a fourth. I, these measuring little scoop things are just so weird. So I normally just gradually move it up and see if there's root burn. If there's not, I keep it at that dosage, you know, and see how the plant performs. It's Sometimes I may push it a little more to see if it gives me root burn, but it's really all on you. But the best recommendation is to start low. Now, I do use a slow release fertilizer as well which are pellets that you're gonna put on your medium, which are like topical, and you just water over it. So the, the fertilizer's already in there every time you water. Now for me, on a different video, I do get complex with it in terms of, you know, putting an eighth of the um, slow release and then an eighth of the fertilizer on fertilizer day during the warm season. <laughs> But that's complicated but most of these slow release fertilizers are standalone so you can just provide the recommended dosage and water and the very special thing about these slow release fertilizers and things that you put in your pot is that they really only dissolve when it's warm so you won't have to worry about over fertilizing in like the cooler seasons when the plant isn't um, absorbing as much nutrients because the the um, fertilizer itself is not going to dissolve at a fast rate as opposed to, you know, temperatures 75 degrees Fahrenheit and above. Now, with regard to fertilizing, there are some people that can say that they can do without it. I, I don't recommend, recommend not doing without fertilizer if you're into the hobby because you want to keep your plant um, as healthy as possible and on a steady routine. It, it, to me, it seems like the plants can very much recognize a routine because I've tried like fertilizing out of my routine and I've seen specific things happen different that didn't happen before, such as like the plant having root tip burn because I did a fertilizing and a fertilizing rather than doing a water in between. So, you know, pay attention to your plant and, and what you're doing. Um, so, you know, with your 
with your phalaenopsis, you'll want to go ahead and fertilize. The, the reason why I'm staying away from paps in this video is because paps need very, very tiny fertilizer, very light fertilizing, and you can most likely get away with not fertilizing your path and just giving them tap water. So that's one of the reasons why I've kind of been staying away from mentioning them, then, mentioning them in the fertilizer video. I don't want you to give your path fertilizer at all. If you need to and you're watching this video, go with like an eighth at like once a month during the cool season and maybe twice a month during the growing season but they really don't need a lot because their roots are very sensitive to salts, like extremely sensitive. And the very final point, as opposed to how I fertilize is what I fertilize with, and I'm gonna keep it short because this is not an endorsement, but I do use an MSU fertilizer because it contains those NPK elements within the ratio, but it also has the micro elements of calcium and magnesium. So I don't have to worry about supplements. In the beginning, I was using um, the Better Grow. You may be using something else as well that doesn't contain uh, magnesium or or calcium, but you can like supplement. There's a there's a liquid soluble um, um, solution called CalMag that you can put in your water to add extra calcium and magnesium. I personally use something called Garden Lime which like my fer slow release fertilizer goes on the pot, lasts about three months like the fertilizer and provides magnesium and calcium when you water. So it just takes away that hassle of having to mix everything because <laughs> I just can't, I can't. And the last thing I'm gonna leave you on with that is just remember to flush your pots, people. All this talk of, of, of fertilizing, fertilizing, fertilizing every once in a while once or twice a month don't put anything in your water and flush the pot if you're using tap put it under the faucet so there's some thought there's some force but if you're using like pure water reverse osmosis or a zero filter you can kind of just make sure the pot is soaked so that it dissolves those salts um then i'll leave you with that and put those social media handles up on the screen for you in case you want to follow me on Instagram as well as my Facebook. I post a ton of pictures and also answer questions on there too. And lastly, on this video, I, I know it's it, it just sounds so redundant to me, but it's very important for the video getting out to people and for me to just answer questions because I, I love answering questions and sharing all this information because I love my babies and I want to hear people's feedback. I want to give people this information to make sure that they can grow their orchids as well and they can read the comments that are in my videos. So just leave your, leave your feedback and let me know um, wh what your thoughts are. And again, I'll leave you with this. You fertilize your orchids weekly. I don't know if that's weekly, weekly, but you do wanna do a, fertili a week fertilization and you can move up or even down from there. But with orchids, because most of the time they're epiphytic or even lithophytes where they don't, where they grow on rocks maybe, or even general specific terms, most of these don't grow in the ground. So they're not used to a constant nutrient absorption. And I'm gonna leave you with that. You all have a wonderful day. See you next video.